general rules for the improvement of knowledge. Rule the first. Deeply possess your mind with the vast importance of a good judgment and the rich and inestimable advantage of right reasoning. Review the instances of your own misconduct in life. Think seriously with yourselves how many follies and sorrows you had escaped, and how much guilt and misery you had prevented if from your early years you had but taken due pains to judge aright concerning persons, times, and things. This will awaken you with lively vigor to address yourselves to the work of improving your reasoning powers, and seizing every opportunity and advantage for that end. The second. Consider the weaknesses, frailties, and mistakes of human nature in general, which arise from the very constitution of a soul united to an animal body, and subjected to many inconveniences thereby. Consider the depth and difficulty of many truths, and the flattering appearances of falsehood, whence arises an infinite variety of dangers to which we are exposed in our judgment of things. Read with greediness those authors that treat of the doctrine of prejudices, prepossessions, and springs of error, on purpose to make your soul watchful on all sides, that it suffer itself as far as possible, to be imposed upon by none of them. The third, a slight view of things so momentous is not sufficient. You should therefore contrive and practice some proper methods to acquaint yourself with your own ignorance, and to impress your mind with a deep and painful sense of the low and imperfect degrees of your present knowledge, that you may be incited with labor and activity to pursue after greater measures. Among others you may find some such methods as these successful. 1. Take a wide survey now and then of the vast and unlimited region of learning. Let your meditations run over the names of all the sciences, with their numerous branchings and innumerable particular themes of knowledge, and then reflect how few of them you are acquainted with in any tolerable degree. The most learned of mortals will never find occasion to act over again what is fabled of Alexander the Great, that when he had conquered what was called the Eastern world, he wept for want of more worlds to conquer. The worlds of science are immense and endless. 2. Think what a numberless variety of questions and difficulties there are belonging even to that particular science in which you have made the greatest progress, and how few of them there are in which you have arrived at a final and undoubted certainty, excepting only those questions in the pure and simple mathematics, whose theorems are demonstrable, and leave scarce any doubt, and yet even in the pursuit of some few of these, mankind have been strangely bewildered. 3. Spend a few thoughts sometimes on the puzzling inquiries concerning vacuums and atoms, the doctrine of infinites, indivisibles, and incommensurables in geometry, wherein there appear some insolvable difficulties. Do this on purpose to give you a more sensible impression of the poverty of your understanding and the imperfection of your knowledge. This will teach you what a vain thing it is to fancy that you know all things, and will instruct you to think modestly of present attainments, when every dust of the earth 
and every inch of empty space surmounts your understanding and triumphs over your presumption arithmo had been bred up to accounts all his life and thought himself a complete master of numbers but when he was pushed hard to give the square root of the number two he tried at it and labored long in millesimal fractions till he confessed there was no end of the inquiry and yet he learned so much modesty by this perplexing question that he was afraid to say it was an impossible thing it is some good degree of improvement when we are afraid to be positive four read the accounts of those vast treasures of knowledge which some of the dead have possessed and some of the living do possess read and be astonished at the almost incredible advances which have been made in science acquaint yourself with some persons of great learning that by a converse among them and comparing yourself with them you may acquire a mean opinion of your own attainments and may thereby be animated with new zeal to equal them as far as possible or to exceed thus let your diligence be quickened by a generous and laudable emulation if venilis had never met with scitorio and pelides he had never imagined himself a mere novice in philosophy nor ever set himself to study in good earnest remember this that if upon some few superficial acquirements you value exalt and swell yourself as though you were a man of learning already you are thereby building a most impassable barrier against all improvement you will lie down and indulge in idleness and rest yourself contented in the midst of deep and shameful ignorance Muli ad scientiam pervenescent si se ilue pervenisse non putescent. The fourth. Presume not too much upon a bright genius, a ready wit, and good parts. For this, without labor and study, will never make a man of knowledge and wisdom. This has been an unhappy temptation to persons of a vigorous and gay fancy to despise learning and study they have been acknowledged to shine in an assembly and sparkle in a discourse on common topics and thence they took it into their heads to abandon reading and labor and grow old in ignorance but when they had lost their vivacity of animal nature and youth they became stupid and sottish even to contempt and ridicule lucidus and scintillo are young men of this stamp they shine in conversation they spread their native riches before the ignorant they pride themselves in their own lively images of fancy and imagine themselves wise and learned but they had best avoid the presence of the skilful and the test of reasoning and i would advise them once a day to think forward a little what a contemptible figure they will make in age the witty men sometimes have sense enough to know their own foible and therefore they craftily shun the attacks of argument or boldly pretend to despise and renounce them because they are conscious of their own ignorance and inwardly confess their want of acquaintance with the skill of reasoning the fifth as you are not to fancy yourself a learned man because you are blessed with a ready wit so neither must you imagine that large and laborious reading and a strong memory 
can denominate you truly wise. What that excellent critic has determined when he decided the question, whether wit or study makes the best poet, may well be applied to every sort of learning. Ego nec studium sine de vita vina, nec rude quid prosit, video ingenium. Alterius sic altera posit, opem res, et conjuret amice. Horace, de artis poetica. Thus made English, concerning poets there has been contest, whether they are made by art or nature best. But if I may presume in this affair, among the rest, my judgment to declare, no art without a genius will avail, and parts without the help of art will fail, but both ingredients jointly must unite, or verse will never shine with a transcendent light. Oldham it is meditation and studious thought. It is the exercise of your own reason and judgment upon all you read that gives good sense even to the best genius, and affords your understanding the truest improvement. A boy of a strong memory may repeat a whole book of Euclid, yet be no geometrician for he may not be able perhaps to demonstrate one single theorem. A well-furnished library and a capacious memory are indeed of singular use toward the improvement of the mind, but if all your learning be nothing else but a mere amassment of what others have written, without a due penetration into the meaning, and without a judicious choice, and determination of your own sentiments, I do not see what title your head has to true learning above your shelves. Though you have read philosophy and theology, morals and metaphysics in abundance, and every other art and science, yet if your memory is the only faculty employed, with the neglect of your reasoning powers, you can justly claim no higher character but that of a good historian of the sciences. The Sixth Be not so weak as to imagine that a life of learning is a life of laziness and ease. Dare not give up yourself to any of the learned professions unless you are resolved to labor hard at study and can make it your delight and the joy of your life, according to the motto of our late Lord Chancellor King. Labor ipse voluptus. Labor itself is a pleasure. It is no idle thing to be a scholar, indeed. A man much addicted to luxury and pleasure, recreation and pastime, should never pretend to devote himself entirely to the sciences, unless his soul be so reformed and refined that he can taste all these entertainments eminently in his closet among his books and papers. Sobrino is a temperate man and a philosopher, and he feeds upon partridge and pheasant, venison and ragots, and every delicacy in a growing and understanding and a serene and healthy soul, though he dines on a dish of sprouts or turnips. Languinus loved his ease, and therefore chose to be brought up a scholar. He had much indulgence in his temper, and as he never cared for study, he falls under universal contempt in his profession because he has nothing but the gown and the name. The seventh. Let the hope of new discoveries, as well as the satisfaction and pleasure of known truths, animate your daily industry. Do not think learning in general is arrived at its perfection 
or that the knowledge of any particular subject in any science cannot be improved, merely because it has lain five hundred or a thousand years without improvement. The present age, by the blessing of God on the ingenuity and diligence of men, has brought to light such truths in natural philosophy, and such discoveries in the heavens and the earth, as seemed to be beyond the reach of man. But may there not be Sir Isaac Newton's in every science? You should never despair, therefore, of finding out that which has never yet been found, unless you see something in the nature of it which renders it unsearchable and above the reach of our faculties. The eighth. Do not hover always on the surface of things, nor take up suddenly with mere appearances, but penetrate into the depth of matters, as far as your time and circumstances allow, especially in those things which relate to your own profession. Do not indulge yourselves to judge of things by the first glimpse, or a short and superficial view of them, for this will fill the mind with errors and prejudices, and give it a wrong turn, and ill habit of thinking, and make much work for retraction. As for those sciences, or those parts of knowledge which either your profession, your leisure, your inclination, or your incapacity forbid you to pursue with much application, or to search far into them, you must be contented with an historical and superficial knowledge of them, and not pretend to form any judgment of your own on those subjects which you understand very imperfectly. The ninth once a day, especially in the early years of life and study, call yourselves to an account what new ideas, what new proposition or truth you have gained, what further confirmation of known truths, and what advances you have made in any part of knowledge, and let no day, if possible, pass away without some intellectual gain. Such a course, well pursued, must certainly advance us in useful knowledge. It is a wise proverb among the learned, borrowed from the lips and practice of a celebrated painter, Nulla dia sine linea. Let no day pass without one line at least. And it was a sacred rule among the Pythagoreans that they should every evening thrice run over the actions and affairs of the day, and examine what their conduct had been, what they had done, or what they had neglected, and they assured their pupils that by this method they would make a noble progress in the path of virtue. Nor let soft slumber close your eyes, before you've recollected thrice the train of action through the day. Where have my feet chose out their way? What have I learned where'er I've been? From all I've heard, from all I've seen. What know I more that's worth the knowing? What have I done that's worth the doing? What have I sought that I should shun? What duty have I left undone, or into what new follies run? These self-inquiries are the road that leads to virtue and to God. I would be glad, among a nation of Christians, to find young men heartily engaged in the practice of what this heathen writer teaches. The Tenth Maintain a constant watch at all times against a dogmatical spirit. Fix not your assent to any proposition in a firm and 
unalterable manner, till you have some firm and unalterable ground for it, and till you have arrived at some clear and sure evidence, till you have turned the proposition on all sides, and searched the matter through and through, so that you cannot be mistaken. And even where you may think you have full grounds of assurance, be not too early nor too frequent in expressing this assurance in too peremptory and positive a manner, remembering that human nature is always liable to mistake in this corrupt and feeble state. A dogmatical spirit has many inconveniences attending it, as 1. It stops the ear against all further reasoning upon that subject, and shuts up the mind from all further improvements of knowledge. If you have resolutely fixed your opinion, though it be upon too slight and insufficient grounds, yet you will stand determined to renounce the strongest reason brought for the contrary opinion and grow obstinate against the force of the clearest argument. Positivo is a man of this character, and has often pronounced his assurance of the Cartesian vortexes. Last year some further light broke in upon his understanding with uncontrollable force by reading something of mathematical philosophy, yet having asserted his former opinions in a most confident manner, he is tempted now to wink a little against the truth, or to prevaricate in his discourse upon that subject, lest by admitting conviction he should expose himself to the necessity of confessing his former folly and mistake, and he has not humility enough for that. 2. A dogmatical spirit naturally leads us to arrogance of mind, and gives a man some airs in conversation which are too haughty and assuming. Audens is a man of learning, and very good company, but his infallible assurance renders his carriage sometimes insupportable. A dogmatical spirit inclines a man to be censorious of his neighbors. Every one of his own opinions appears to him written as it were with sunbeams, and he grows angry that his neighbor does not see it in the same light. He is tempted to disdain his correspondence as men of a low and dark understanding because they will not believe what he does. Furio goes farther in this wild track, and charges those who refuse his notions with willful obstinacy and vile hypocrisy. He tells them boldly that they resist the truth and sin against their consciences. The Eleventh though caution and slow assent will guard you against frequent mistakes and retractions, yet you should get humility and courage enough to retract any mistake and confess an error. Frequent changes are tokens of levity in our first determinations. Yet you should never be too proud to change your opinion nor frightened at the name of changeling. Learn to scorn those vulgar bugbears which confirm foolish man in his old mistakes, for fear of being charged with inconstancy. I confess it is better not to judge than to judge falsely. It is wiser to withhold our assent till we see complete evidence. But if we have too suddenly given up our assent, as the wisest man does sometimes, if we have professed what we find afterwards to be false, we should never be ashamed nor afraid 
to renounce a mistake. That is a noble essay which is found among the occasional papers. Quote, to encourage the world to practice retractions, unquote. And I would recommend it to the perusal of every scholar and every Christian. The twelfth, he that would raise his judgment above the vulgar rank of mankind, and learn to pass a just sentence on persons and things, must take heed of a fanciful temper of mind, and a humorous conduct in his affairs. Fancy and humor, early and constantly indulged, may expect an old age overrun with follies. The notion of a humorist is one that is greatly pleased or greatly displeased with little things, who sets his heart much upon matters of very small importance who has his will determined every day by trifles, his actions seldom directed by the reason and nature of things, and his passions frequently raised by things of little moment. Where this practice is allowed, it will insensibly warp the judgment to pronounce little things great, and tempt you to lay a great weight upon them. In short, this temper will incline you to pass an unjust value on almost everything that occurs, and every step you take in this path is just so far out of the way to wisdom. The thirteenth. For the same reason, have a care of trifling with things important and momentous, or of sporting with things awful and sacred, do not indulge a spirit of ridicule, as some witty men do on all occasions and subjects. This will as unhappily bias the judgment on the other side, and incline you to pass a low esteem on the most valuable objects. Whatsoever evil habit we indulge in practice, it will insensibly obtain a power over our understanding, and betray us into many errors. Jokander is ready with his jests to answer everything that he hears. He reads books in the same jovial humor, and has gotten the art of turning every thought and sentence into merriment. How many awkward and irregular judgments does this man pass upon solemn subjects? even when he designs to be grave and in earnest. His mirth and laughing humor is formed into habit and temper, and leads his understanding shamefully astray. You will see him wandering in pursuit of a gay flying feather, and he is drawn by a sort of ignis fatuus into bogs and mire almost every day of his life. The fourteenth, ever maintain a virtuous and pious frame of spirit, for an indulgence of vicious inclinations debases the understanding and perverts the judgment. Hordom and wine and new wine take away the heart and soul and reason of a man. Sensuality ruins the better faculties of the mind. An indulgence to appetite and passion enfeebles the powers of reason. It makes the judgment weak and susceptible of every falsehood, and especially of such mistakes as have a tendency towards the gratification of the animal. And it warps the soul, aside strangely from that steadfast honesty and integrity that necessarily belongs to the pursuit of truth. It is the virtuous man who is in a fair way to wisdom. Quote, God gives to those that are good in his sight wisdom, and knowledge and joy. Unquote. Ecclesiastes 2.26 
the fifteenth watch against the pride of your own reason and a vain conceit of your own intellectual powers with the neglect of divine aid and blessing presume not upon great attainments in knowledge by your own self-sufficiency those who trust to their own understanding entirely are pronounced fools in the word of god and it is the wisest of men gives them this character quote, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool unquote. proverbs twenty eight twenty six and the same divine writer advises us to quote, trust in the lord with all our heart and not to lean to our understandings nor to be wise in our own eyes unquote. chapter three five seven the sixteenth offer up therefore your daily requests to god the father of lights that he would bless all your attempts and labors in reading study and conversation think with yourself how easily and how insensibly by one turn of thought he can lead you into a large scene of useful ideas he can teach you to lay hold on a clue which may guide your thoughts with safety and ease through all the difficulties of an intricate subject think how easily the author of your beings can direct your motions by his providence so that the glance of an eye or a word striking the ear or a sudden turn of the fancy shall conduct you to a train of happy sentiments by his secret and supreme method of government he can draw you to read such a treatise or converse with such a person who may give you more light into some deep subject in an hour than you could obtain by a month of your own solitary labor implore constantly his divine grace to point your inclination to proper studies and to fix your heart there he can keep off temptations on the right hand and on the left both by the course of his providence and by the secret and insensible intimations of his spirit he can guard your understandings from every evil influence of error and secure you from the danger of evil books and men which might otherwise have a fatal effect and lead you into pernicious mistakes even the poets call upon the muse as a goddess to assist them in their compositions the first lines of homer in his iliad and his odyssey the first line of musaeus in his song of hero and leander the beginning of hesiod in his poem of works and days and several others furnish us with sufficient examples of this kind nor does ovid leave out this piece of devotion as he begins his stories of the metamorphoses christianity so much the more obliges us by the precepts of scripture to invoke the assistance of the true god in all our labors of the mind for the improvement of ourselves and others bishop saunderson says that study without prayer is atheism as well as that prayer without study is presumption and we are still more abundantly encouraged by the testimony of those who have acknowledged from their own experience that sincere prayer was no hindrance to their studies they have gotten more knowledge sometimes upon their knees than by their labor in perusing a variety of authors and they have left this observation for such as follow bene arase est bene studuisi praying is the best studying to conclude let industry and devotion join together 
and you need not doubt the happy success. Proverbs 2.2 2. Quote, Incline thine ear to wisdom, apply thine heart to understanding, cry after knowledge, and lift up thy voice, seek her as silver, and search for her as for hidden treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, unquote, etc., which, quote, is the beginning of wisdom, unquote. It is, quote, the Lord who gives wisdom even to the simple, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding, unquote. End of chapter 1 Read by Ron Altman